Have you lost hope that nothing can be done to change our world? Let me put things in biblical and historical perspective for you. American Vision is an organization that is, uh, in, on the short term, pessimistic, but in the long term, optimistic. And we get lots of emails from people uh, really kind of joyous in their idea that the, the worse things get, the better things are for them. And when we talk about we can change our world, they really get indignant about it. I mean, downright angry. I had one particular emailer, of course, shouting at me in all capital letters, making no sense whatsoever and sees that the, the, the problems that we're facing today are, are insurmountable. We, you know, we have Barack Obama in the presidency, we're moving towards socialism. Uh, the, you know, the Middle East is about, about to blow up, we're about to run out of oil. Uh, and you have, you have all of these uh, kind of cultural indicators giving people evidence that we're living uh, at, at, at the end of history. Same is true with, with earthquakes uh, and, and, and so forth. And yet, when you look at the Bible and you look at history, you can really come to a completely different conclusion. This is why American Vision spends a great deal of time on the eschatological issue, because I believe that a person's view of the future determines how he's going to live in the present. And uh, if we as Christians don't grasp this, this understanding, uh, we'll never come uh, to, the, to the place in life where we, we really can believe we can make a change. Uh, this, is, uh, this is why I've written a number of books on Bible prophecy, One Last Day's Madness, another one, Why the End of the World is Not in Your Future, Is Jesus Coming Soon, and I'm working on a, another book uh, that I'm uh, in, in my preparation for my debate with Jim Fletcher on uh, June 19th of uh, 2010, which will be held at Midway Presbyterian Church. And I'm going to take you to a passage that a lot of people use as, a, as an indicator, as a prophetic indicator. Uh, that, uh, number one, we're living in the last days, and how many people ha have, in fact, uh, taught that over the years? And, and number two, uh, that, it, that it, uh, it, it deals with a, uh, uh, an incontrovertible uh, proposition that evil tends uh, to, to flow t towards those uh, in, in, in power to the extent that it overwhelms all the good. And so let me, let me start with this, uh, with this chapter. Uh, Paul writes, remember, he's speaking directly to Timothy, so the primary audience recipient here is Timothy. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Now, a lot of Christians read that passage, and say, that particular verse, and say, well, see, G Paul's talking about what's going to happen in the distant future. No, the last days was the last days of their era, the last days of the Old Covenant. Uh, the, you know, Paul talks about uh, and, and the, how the ends, ends of the ages have, have, have come upon them. And in, in, in the book of Hebrews, you see something very interesting right at the beginning of the chapter. It says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Uh, and in another place, uh, uh, Paul writes about the about uh, like avoiding Israel's mistakes in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, and he says uh, something interesting later in this particular chapter, and he says, um, uh, "Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come." And so, in the New Testament talks about the ends of the ages, or the end of the age, uh, or the last days. It's not talking about something in the distant future. It's talking about something that's in their future. It's, a, it's the end of an era. Uh, the, the, both the Hebrew and the Greek really doesn't, you know, they don't have words for in the future or the distant future. And so context is everything. And then Paul, in verses 2 through 7, outlines uh, kind of ethical characteristics of, the, of that day. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, uh, revilers, disobedient to, uh, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, and, and avoid such men as these, 
for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins led on by various impulses, always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. People read that and say, hey, that's just like today. And I would say, well, you're absolutely right. It's just like today. In fact, it's like every generation. It was just like that in Timothy's day. And that's Paul's point. Uh, this is the way the world works. Now, the question we have to ask is, uh, how, how should we then live in a culture like this? Do we sit back? Do we build our walls? Do we go into our churches? Do we preach about the end times? Do we say it's hopeless? Do we just look for uh, some sort of remedy in the rapture? Not at all. Paul doesn't say anything about that. Uh, he says, and just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind rejected as regards the faith. He says, look, remember Janus and Jambres. These were the sorcerer high priests who confronted Moses in, Fa in Pharaoh's court when Moses and Aaron came in. And the only thing that Aaron had in his hand was this, the, uh, the almond uh, branch, a stick. And you, you know what happened next. Uh, Moses takes the, 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 uh, the stick and throws it down and becomes a serpent. Janus and Jambres come, down, come, come out. They throw their sticks that were probably already serpents down. And Aaron's rod that had became a serpent consumes their rods. It just it goes, it goes to show you who is really in control. And here you have probably the most powerful, the, what, it was the most powerful nation in the world at that time. You had a Pharaoh sitting on the throne who thought he was God. Um, that, that he's depicted as a bald head with that golden sunburst around him. He was God in human flesh. Uh, that was the belief of, of the Egyptians. And then, then you have uh, uh, the, the, the ten plagues going after all the gods of Egypt. And those, those sorcerer high priests couldn't do anything. Uh, they, the, the, they couldn't turn the, the, the bloody water back into fresh water. They had no power. Uh, then verse 9, but they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, as also that of those two came to be. And Paul sent me to Timothy, look, this is pure, their, their, their worldview is folly. But you can't just sit back and wait for it to collapse. You have to be able to put something in its place in the meantime. And, and Paul says, this is what you must do. You must follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance. Even persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me at, at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions out of, uh, I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. This is where we are in a culture today. We've got to make a decision here. Are we going to sit back and wait for all of this to collapse in around us, or are we going to make an impact at, this, at the self-control level, at the family level, at the church level, at the uh, educational level and at the political level. This is, this is our choice. This is what we need to do. Paul doesn't discount persecution, verse 12, and indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Uh, they're the ones who are deceiving and being deceived, and the only reason they get, around, uh, get away with it is because we as Christians aren't out there pounding them in their deception. Now, this is all beginning to change, but we have to keep it up. And Paul, final admonition to Timothy, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from your childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God might be equipped for every good work. That's our instruction. And if it was good enough for Timothy in his day, with uh, under the oppression of the Roman Empire, with no hope of change, no, no, no political rights. I mean, the Apostle Paul himself uh, had to call on his Roman citizenship in order uh, to, uh, to, to, to get him to, to Rome. Most people didn't have any Roman citizenship. We have all the freedoms afforded to us. They're all out there. All we have to do is take advantage of them. And if Christians won't do that, they deserve what they're going to get. And this is why American Vision is putting on the Biblical Worldview Conference in July 21st to the, to the 24th uh, in, uh, in Powder Springs, Georgia at Midway Presbyterian Church. Go to AmericanVision.com, AmericanVision.org for more information. For more information about this summer's Worldview Super Conference, visit conference.americanvision.org. That's conference.americanvision.org.